Have you ever seen those maximum occupancy signs in a room somewhere and wondered, why is it that number? This room couldn't fit 100 people, could it? Well, believe it or not, architects need to calculate that number to design a room in case of a fire. So today, I'm gonna to be showing you how we figure out the occupant load for a building by using a real project as an example. Welcome to another episode of the Weekly Wrap Up. My name is Tyler, and I'm a designer at an architecture firm here in California. If you're new here, thanks for stopping by, I appreciate it. I post weekly updates of what it's like to work in an architecture office, as well as other videos related to architecture and design. So if you find that kind of stuff interesting, consider subscribing down below, and let me know what else you wanna see from me. All right, let's get into this week's work. Last week I showed you all a new project that I had to switch over and help out with. My task with this project last week was to do some research and see where we needed to add roof ventilation. I took you all through my process of looking at the roof construction, the reflected ceiling plan, or the RCP for short, looking at the building section to understand the attic space, and finally the building code to see what we're required to do. If you wanna see how I went through this process, I'll leave a card above if you wanna go check out that episode. All of these steps come together so we can make informed decisions about our designs. Most importantly, we have to go through these steps to make sure we're designing safe and code compliant buildings. Which brings us to today's episode. Those maximum occupancy signs that you see in spaces like auditoriums are put there to protect everyone inside in case of a fire. And that number on the sign is called the occupant load. It's determined by the building code, the square footage of the space, and what that space is used for but I'll get to that process in a minute. We're talking about this today because I had to take this new project that I'm helping on and create a code compliance plan to show that we're meeting all the requirements for emergency exiting. In architecture, we call this egress. The definition is simply the action of going out or leaving a place. As architects, we have to plan for emergencies like fires and make sure that everyone can exit the building safely. To do this, we have to plan on where the exits are and how many there are based on the space we're designing. So the floor plan for this building is pretty simple. On the west end, it's a long corridor with offices on either side. In the middle of the building is where the main entry is and it's also where the lobby and the reception desk are. As we move to the east end, we have the restrooms, the break room and the meeting room. There's also some storage and janitor spaces but those aren't as important for emergency exiting purposes. To get started on this plan, I need to know what each room is classified as according to the building code. So we'll go there first. Like I said earlier, we're talking about egress for emergency exiting. So we're gonna be looking at chapter 10, which is the means of egress. Here, we can see that section 1004 is the section for occupant load. We need this table right here, table 1004.5 for maximum floor area allowances per occupant. This is gonna tell us how many people we're allowed to have in the room based on the square footage and the space that it's classified as. We'll go back to our plan and see what kind of spaces we have according to the code. So on the west end, we have all these offices. And according to the table from the code, these are classified as business areas. There's definitions in the code at the beginning that define all of these, but I'll save you from going through all that. Just trust me on these. So the table tells us that for a business area, we need to use 150. This means that for every 150 square feet, we can only have one person in that space. If the office was smaller than 150 square feet, we would still use that same number and we would still only have one person in that space. But if it was larger than 150, then we can have more than one person. And we'll see where that happens in our plan. The first one, office C, is 161 square feet. I know this because the software I'm using takes any space that's bounded by walls and automatically creates the square footage for me. When I click on this room, you can see that it's picking up the space in the office and in the properties, it tells me that the square footage is 160.59. So we'll round up to 161. Our table from the code said to use 150 for this space. So we'll divide 161 by 150 to get 1.07. And since this is bigger than one, we have to plan for two people in this office. The way the code works, it wants you to plan for a worst case scenario. 
So we round up the numbers to plan for more people to make sure we're safe in emergency situations. I'll go through and do this calculation for all the offices here. our first space that's not an office. We have a conference room here and the code treats spaces like this differently. This is classified as an assembly space because there's multiple people gathering here for a specific purpose. The code has different definitions for different types of assembly spaces like churches, auditoriums, and meeting rooms. But we won't go too far into those. Back to our plan, we can see that this space is 239 square feet. So divided by 15 square feet gives us a total of 16 people allowed in this space. The lobby and reception desk is classified as a business space like the offices. It's not classified as an assembly space because people aren't really meant to gather here for a specific purpose. So we'll use our 150 square foot occupant load factor and we'll find that we can only have five people in this space based on the overall square footage of 614 square feet. At the east end of the building, the break room is classified as an assembly space. It's different than the conference room, but a group of people are gonna be gathered here for a period of time during their breaks and lunches. This qualifies it as a gathering space for a specific purpose. And since it has tables and chairs, we'll use this number of 15 square feet to calculate that we can have up to 23 people in this room. Now you might have noticed that I haven't talked about the corridors, the storage rooms, or the bathrooms yet. That's because when we do these calculations for egress or emergency exiting, we only do them for habitable spaces. Habitable space is a space in a building that's used for living, eating, sleeping, or cooking. You don't really spend a lot of time in a hallway other than walking through it, so it's not considered a habitable space. And you don't really spend all day in storage rooms or bathrooms, or well, maybe some of you do. But these are also not considered habitable, so we don't include them in our calculation. Lastly, we'll look at the meeting room at the far east end of the building. This is also classified as an assembly space, but you'll notice there's only chairs in this room. As a quick side note, you can see the table we've been referencing specifically calls this out as concentrated chairs, not fixed. This is because we're using portable chairs in this meeting room. If we were talking about a space like an auditorium or a movie theater, these are both assembly spaces, but the chairs are fixed to the ground. In those scenarios, the calculation for maximum number of people allowed is actually just the total number of seats that are fixed in that space. But this is just a quick example to show you how we distinguish between different types of assembly spaces. Okay, let's finish this plan. You might notice that things look a little bit different here. There's more lines drawn and there's more exit doors. So this space is 823 square feet and we have to use seven square feet per person based on our code reference. This gives us 118 people allowed for this room. Now there's definitely not 118 chairs in this room. There's actually only 70. But remember what I said earlier, we have to plan for a worst case scenario in an emergency situation. So we have to plan for a maximum of 118 people just in case. And here's where things get a little tricky. The code tells us that for assembly spaces with more than 49 people, we have to provide at least two exits. Now there's a couple different reasons for this, but I won't go too far into that right now. For now, just know that we have to take our total 118 people and split them in half so each half of the room has a door to exit from. There's another code requirement that says these doors have to be a certain distance away from each other, but again, that's getting into the details. In this room, the conference room, and the break room, we'll actually put one of those maximum occupancy signs up on the wall, and it'll have the number on it that we actually calculated here. This is required in all spaces that are classified as assembly spaces. So the next time you're in a room and you see one of those max occupancy signs, you'll know why it's up there and how that max number was calculated. Don't forget to look for that second exit in case of an emergency too. I hope you learned something from this, and if you did, don't forget to like the video. But for now, 
That's gonna do it for this episode of the Weekly Wrap Up. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.